the, there's been a bit of controversy here, but um, there's been much more controversy about what our next speaker will be talking about uh, in a moment. Uh, the last time uh, him and his uh, co-author, David Hockney, were here uh, expounding their theory at the Met, there were picketers outside. Um, you've seen extensive security, uh, barricades, don't mistake them for, for anti-Falco demonstrators. It's, it's another event. But uh, I really believe that uh, if, if there's something that will get me fired uh, at the Met, this is possibly this lecture. I think it's also going to be uh, an extremely entertaining and, and interesting uh, excursion in, in, in physics. Um, archaeology of the Renaissance and, uh, and art history. So um, I hope we can, uh, you will welcome here Charles Falco, uh, the Chair of Condensed, Condensed Matter Physics and a Professor of Optical Sciences at the University of Arizona. And I'll leave you. So I um, am the only speaker who um, is starting the lecture with a fanfare of trumpets, so I hope this lives up to it. Unfortunately, I have about 20% more material than I should have for a lecture of the appropriate length, so I'm going to talk 20% too fast. You can download all of my papers from my website, though, and all the information there. A few quick acknowledgments. I'll talk about David Hockey in a second. Um, David Graves and Richard Smith are David's assistants in his London and Los Angeles studios. Martin Kemp is an art historian at Oxford who helped David with some of his early uh, work. Jose Sassian is a colleague of mine in the College of Optical Sciences who ran an early ray tracing uh, calculation. I'm not going to show that today. I'll tell you about the other two in a moment. An outline of what we're going to cover this afternoon is I'm going to give you a, a general introduction to what this whole topic is about and talk about the technology that was available at the end of the medieval period for projecting images. Then I'm going to talk about optics. I'm going to teach you all the optics you need to know to evaluate the evidence I'm going to show you, and I promise I won't teach you any extra optics. So this is the part of the talk you really do have to pay attention to. And then I'm going to show you selected evidence of various kinds. I, I, I've, I honestly could talk for... Um, I don't know, more than 12 hours with the evidence that we've collected at the rate I'm talking today. So I've got to pick and choose different pieces of evidence. Some of the evidence addresses certain aspects, other evidence different aspects, and I've tried to pick and choose appropriate evidence to show you, and then I'll conclude. David Hockney, um, for our purposes, since this was a uh, part of, not was, is part of the uh, World Science Festival, I assume there might be audiences also of scientists and artists. So a little bit to give you David background. David our most celebrated living artist. He is considered to be one of Britain's greatest contemporary artists. His originality and skill have ensured his success from the beginning of his career. The reason why this is relevant, why I want to talk about it is, is David's eye as an artist was a critical factor in looking and seeing certain evidence in certain paintings that led him to believe optics had been used. And I, mean, I admit, for instance, I'm, I am interested in pictures. I keep saying this. I'm interested in uh, how you make pictures. You can go back through David's writings back 30 years, and you can see certain paintings have bothered him. Bothered him in a scientific kind of sense. Any scientist in the audience will tell you that sometimes they've done some experiment, didn't have the technology to, to collect the data they needed, many years later, new instruments are developed, have gone back to solve the original problem. It's kept bothering them. And there are many of these issues that I'm going to talk about today. It's because David has been interested in how paintings are made. Already our technology is letting us down. There we go. The other two acknowledgments. In 2000, Lawrence Weschler wrote in The New Yorker an article about how David Hockney had an idea that certain paintings were had optics used. And he really didn't understand at the time what he meant by optics other than it will distinguish between there's the optical projection of images and the use of those projected images, as I'm going to show you, or there's eyeballing, just how we traditionally think about how artists use, uh, do paintings. Uh, another story we don't have time to go into. I was co-curator of the Art of the Motorcycle at the Guggenheim 10 years ago. My co-curator, my fellow co-curator, Alton Guilfoyle, um, called me when this article appeared, said, I'm in Tucson, 
He knows I'm interested in art, knows I'm interested in optics, and said, Falco, I don't care what you're doing, drop it, go by the New Yorker, read that article, and call me back. Typical New Yorker didn't realize that the New Yorker doesn't get delivered in Tucson, Arizona. The same day, so the, the stories paused for two days until the New Yorker showed up. Then Alton put me in contact with Ren Weschler, who put me in contact with David Hockney, and this became the most intensive scientific collaboration of my entire career. In the first six months, David and I exchanged a ream of faxes, 500 pages of faxes, and we weren't Xeroxing books, as, uh, books and sending um, copies of, of articles from books. These were handwritten or typed faxes. It was a very heady time, and such that the European Sound Science Foundation has organized a uh, symposium on what I'm going to tell you today is the Hockney-Falco thesis. It's what is the scientific evidence that shows that artists early in the Renaissance were using optics. And the important point about this is that every painting I'm going to show you today is from the, the Metropolitan Museum, the, the Louvre, the Hermitage, from major museums that are visited by an estimate if you believe their, their attendance figures, which there's reasons actually not to believe, but if you believe their attendance figures, 25 million people a year see all the artworks I'm going to show you, and 25 million people a year, year after year, didn't see what I'm going to show you that we extract from these paintings. And as Marco pointed out, um, the, this is uh, in flames passions. There was, this is a press release 2004, this group picketed the Met and um, marched with petitions denouncing us for having defamed the old masters. Now, there are many things you could picket for, and there are reasonable things to picket for. If at the end I've convinced you that, that Jan van Eyck used a lens, you know, that's not, well, you have to be pretty passionate to picket against that, to denounce people for that. <laughs> Most scholars would agree that Optical instruments first appeared late in the Renaissance with the invention of the telescope by Galileo. Now, if you're an expert, you know, well, Galileo didn't invent the telescope. People say he kind of stole the idea from a Dutchman at the time. But the, the year 1600 or 1598, nobody disagrees with that. If you want to um, project an image, you need a lens. Mirrors only reflect images. You just go to the restroom, convince yourself of that. Van Eyck, Bellini, these were Renaissance masters that use work by sheer genius alone. If what I'm going to show you tonight, this afternoon, is true, all of these statements are false. They're not false on a technicality. They're fundamentally false. So the evidence I'm going to show you actually goes to the foundations of a liberal arts education. If we look um, in humans' attempts to represent the human form in two dimensions, well, 1900 BC, we learned two things from this. One is that they couldn't paint very realistically 4,000 years ago. And they also, though, they can paint better than I can. We come forward in time, much more elaborate, but still a flat, two-dimensional look to it. But we come to Van Eyck. If this man walked out through that door right now, everyone in this auditorium would instantly recognize them. How did Van Eyck capture such realism and it turns out there's a clue, a very strong clue, in the painting itself. <laughs> Everything I'm going to show you today, every aspect of optics that I'm going to show you that's used by artists, could have been done with this pair of spectacles, with a pair of reading glasses, like many of the people in this audience are wearing. You can project images, beautiful images, and I'm going to show you with a pair of reading glasses. I'm also going to show you that there's really strong circumstantial evidence that early on that they didn't use reading glasses, they used concave mirrors. But one thing we're going to say, Van Eyck used optics. He had the optics in his painting, so clearly it existed at the time. So my lab is on the 10th floor of a building. We're going to be looking down. I'm going to have my assistant turn that pair of reading glasses, and you're going to see the projected image. And she'll stop at a certain point. We come back, we see the projected image. And we stop here, we see the projected image, the sky is above, sorry, the directly reflected image from the, just the front surface of the glasses. The sky is above, the ground is below. Projected images are upside down. Every projected image is upside down. The ground is above, the sky is below. But you can see we can project images with spectacles. <laughs> 